first of all, like if you want to hire Markham where I used to work for a show, if, if you hire them a year out, it's honestly a waste of everyone's time because, you know, they, I, I think what they can do in a week, um, the magic of what they can do, uh, in a week is, is so amazing. Um, that I'm like, what are they going to do with the extra 51 weeks? Um, and that just comes from the fact that Greg and Paul, um, the owners, uh, they, they're political production folks and they come from the advanced world where we're used to four or five days, you know, in the political context, um, things change so fast, you know, there's, top-down strategy that comes from the candidate and the campaign manager. But then there's the things you can't control, like natural disasters or what the other campaign might be doing or how the media will cover all of that. Hmm. And that impacts the overall communication strategy. It impacts the um, the schedule for the surrogates. Um, it impacts the schedule for the actual candidates and the principals that are going out to you know, campaign on their behalf. I probably texted you 24 hours after we knew for sure we were going and maybe somebody on a spreadsheet or on a calendar knew that was going to happen for a couple of days more than that but it it really wouldn't have existed longer than that in a campaign context because you know to a certain extent you're making it up as you go you know when you're dealing with the president or the vice president and or these high level political principles presidential candidates security isn't the last consideration it's the first consideration as it should be as it has to be sometimes a company is really excited to host uh, but they don't really fully understand a company or, or a venue they don't fully understand the impact what with security and not just security but like the production setup require you know days of load in and rehearsal and then, first i'm sorry all, to, to interrupt you again but let me just make please. a comparison that i think uh, you know the comparison is that concert production might be scheduled out a year in advance. Yeah. And we got to get all these things. And, and um, yeah, concert sound, it just, when I'm hired for a concert sound event for, in comparison, it's probably three months from now, you know, and they might even start production on it a year from then. And when you do theater, it's usually a year from then. Uh, I think the exigencies of the concerts and the, and theatrical performances at the end of the day it's an economic endeavor they they, they are trying to make money um, or mm. if it's you know a foundation um you know some, something like philanthropy or or for a charity thing um there's a set budget and then in that case they're not trying to make money but they know what they're doing and they know what the goal is people forget this about political principles um you know taylor swift incredible tour that, that just ended and, and what they just did on the production side and the logistics side was a master class uh, i want to say in addition to what i just said they got to do that tour dozens of times in cities and the muscle memory is there everybody knows their part from the lighting folks to the power folks to the yeah. when they're giving that ginormous speech to thirty thousand people that is the first time they have ever walked out to that event site. That is the first time, sometimes the first time they've ever been in that city before. And definitely the first time they've ever walked out onto that stage where that podium is um, and heard that audio through the PA in that environment. Sometimes, um, you know, when the president uh, or any kind of political principal with a big footprint would visit, you know, a big company that and typically like some of the Fortune 500 companies, as you know, employ really talented creative agencies and production agencies, you know, these experiential companies that do amazing work, you know, trade shows and, you know, 7D experiences and 5D things, you know, things I can't even think about and really amazing productions. Um, that they, but they have a, a longer runway on some of those where they've got CAD renderings, 3D plans, um, and then a, a political principal comes in and it's like, Hey, here are our production requirements. Hey, here's our security requirements. Hey, here's our program changes that we are requesting given the content of the day. Um, it really can throw folks because they're like, you want to flip the room 90 degrees or you want to do it in a different building? Um, and, you know, the difference is, especially like in the political production, you know, realm, you're also thinking about what time of day is my principal going to speak? Are they coming from 50 other events and are they going to be maybe a little more soft-spoken today? Will it be like first thing in the morning? Um, and, you know, like if it's the first thing they're doing, are they going to have more energy and be maybe a little louder? Um, you know, uh, trying to think of like some principles that I've worked for where just try to anticipate, you know, oh gosh, they're maybe they're getting over a cold or 
coming off of the, let's say, a caucus night where you've just been campaigning for weeks and weeks and weeks and, um, hey, we might need a little more headroom today or, mm-hmm. you know, this person might have a, some lows, you know, sometimes you get a sore throat on the campaign trail, things like that. So oftentimes I'll try to anticipate, you know, where things are at. I'll, like similar to what you said, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of listen back to the public appearances of that last 24 hours, see where things are at um, and kind of listen um, to how that might might go. It's such a unique thing, right? Where you want the guests to have an amazing experience. I jokingly call it, I call it internally when I when I worked at the White House, like the state dinner paradox, which is like every event we have to imagine is like a state dinner where you've got heads of state, diplomats, CEOs, bajillionaires, the president, the first family, um, really important guests, but there's only 200 of them. And they're really important. And we want them to have an amazing experience at the state dinner and hear every little thing. But that toast that the president and the foreign leader that's visiting are going to give could be watched by 100 million people. You know, may sometimes more, um, depending on the scale of it and if it's live and all those considerations. So um, there are often times we are forced to make decisions at the detriment. That sounds so dramatic, but, you know from a physics perspective and from a literal noise and, and sound perspective at the detriment to the guests in the room um, to preserve the integrity of the broadcast mix. Um, well, just, well, for example, I, one of my biggest concerns is like, how are we going to get enough game before feedback? One of the hardest things, because if the person talks softly and they stand back from the mic and depending on what kind of mic we use and the acoustics and sound system setup and all these things, I could be screwed basically. But in these situations, it's actually okay, I learned, if it's a little bit quieter in the room. Number one, because if it's the president of the United States, people are going to shut the hell up in most cases. And number two, because it doesn't need to be super loud in the room because the broadcast is way more important. Yeah. And, um, you know, whereas if you're at a gymnastics competition, somebody in the back might shout, make it louder. But for the most part, with the president of the United States or for a big political principal, you're not going to have that because, like you said, there's an implied deference. But if there is an issue with a member, like the, the press pool's cable or camera, and they're not getting clean audio, it's not like, oh, our thing is perfect. They didn't get it. It's no one can see the event in the world because the camera broadcasting to millions of people isn't working properly. Um, so exuding calm and uh, you know having information and you know leading with facts instead of panic or, um, you know, assumptions is so important because you really need to show that principle and the team around them. And also like the members of the media and secret service that are with us, um, they, they might have challenges too. And and you want to be a good partner for them. Um, because for example, like our production could be flawless, but if there is an issue with a member, like the, the press pools, cable or camera, and they're not getting clean audio, it's not like, Oh, our thing is perfect. They didn't get it. It's, no one can see the event in the world because the camera broadcasting to millions of people isn't working properly. We're all, all on deck to help fix that ourselves because obviously we want it to go well, but it doesn't really matter where our stuff ends and their stuff starts because it, we're just one team trying to trying to get it done. Um, and I, I approach failure the same way too because obviously we like to anticipate as much as we can, but no world-class event producer can tell you with a straight face they've never had something break or fall or fail or a mic ring out. It's just not possible because at the end of the day too, when, when something goes wrong, that panic, or if you're, if you're going to say fix that right now, or kind of something like that, like we're halfway through a show, like that person then is not going to be confident about the 16 other cues we have. Um, so you really always, you know, in my mindset, I, I always want to make sure um, we're keeping it loose, having a little bit of fun when we can. Um, and I try to redirect, um, you know, any, any stress towards other things um, because, you know, at the end of the day, the, the mission necessitates it. And I, you know, to be honest too, like this was a trickier one than normal because our planning and um, our build out, some of the elements started before January 6th, um, before that, you know, horrible day um, when those protesters breached the Capitol and, you know, th- then after I, I raised that just in the regard that a lot of the security posture changed after that, you know, the mm. perimeters changed things that we thought were not going to be in our perimeter were in the perimeter and sort of vice versa. Um, so we all had to adjust cable paths. 
um, I, I do remember a lot of different power paths that we had from the generators. Um, we had planned along the inside of some of that really big anti-scale fencing, um, just be, for obvious like human safety, you know, considerations. So people aren't tripping and things like that. Um, because for a lot of these ancillary sort of hubs, for lack of a better term, like at New York Avenue, at G Street, at F Street, we had generators just to avoid running power past the point of, um, you know, losing, you know, power because of the distance. Yeah. Um, and then when the sort of the, the fencing plan changed or moved around a little bit, we had to really reconsider, oh, that generator is now in the secure zone or that one's not. Um, and really adjust. And that was just chaos. <laughs> I remember at one point, our generator was like, one of the generators like locked in by fencing. And I'm like, well, we're never going to see that generator again. And this is not political, but just one of the most amazing moments was, obviously, there's hundreds and actually thousands of police officers and military personnel that line, both from like a protocol and honorific way to, for the inauguration, but also for security that line the parade route. And seeing all the military folks and volunteers and firefighters helping out you know, make sure the cables and, and things were weighted down and the scenic things weren't flying away. It was really special, like just a bu- literally hundreds of people. Um, I mean, there were hundreds of people that helped that event from not being a disaster, um, you know, weighing things down. Um, and really just because of the safety element of things flying in the air at inauguration, not ideal. Um, and you had Secret Service folks helping out too. Um, and really just all hands on deck of, of <laughs> making things safe enough that the, uh, the parade could, could continue. You know, some moments, you know, at the White House or in political production are, you know, a little bit more uh, intense than others. And it's already at a very high level um, of stress and, you know, level of production precision that's required. And, um, yeah, like the o- Oval Office addresses are, are rare. Um, you know, presidents give them a handful of times, if that many. And uh, this was a photo of. President Biden's first one. And, um, you know, just everything has a backup. Uh, you know, every detail has to be thought through, you know, what doors are we running? What cables underneath? How do we run power, you know, very far away from any kind of data? Um, and, you know, it, it's still a working office. So you, you're at the demands of the schedule um, of whatever's going on on the day. Gosh, um, it is so incredible um you know what i'll say is this like when you walk into the building you have this expectation of what the secret service will be like or what the military personnel that work there will be like what the career officials will be like um what the other political appointees will be like but then when you actually work with them and and see how dedicated to the mission these folks are every single day Mm. it's just it's overwhelming um People that you'll never hear of. I'm not talking about the press secretary or the really kind of high visibility positions, but just the folks that show up every day to do a job. You would never know their name. Um, you would never really un- understand their individual contribution, but it's huge. And the public servants that go into that building every day um, with thankless hours, with no, um, you know, they don't get a pat on the bat. Um, it's really um, a-, a grind. And um, you know, it, it's remarkable. They're, they're so incredible that the teamwork that goes into it. Um, but just, I, I think the bottom line is the the folks that keep that building running from the secret service, um, to the amazing folks in the military to, um, career folks that, you know, the, the white house ushers and the chefs and the butlers, um, they just do such an amazing, amazing job and, um, getting to meet them and work with them is just the the highlight of my life for sure.